Welcome to the Motormouth YouTube channel. I'm Zach. I'm Andrea. And we do full length car reviews each and every week and we stop halfway through for a segment called Questions Coffee and Cars and we've spun it off. Milestone, Andrea. We're at number 70. How do you get a question in? Follow along on Instagram at motormouth underscore Andrea. Every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Pacific time, I put a post out and we gather the questions. It's not up for that long. And then the post is deleted and we start the show. Time now for questions, coffee and cars. Your questions from Instagram. If you have an EV and will be traveling for a while, more than a month, should you keep it plugged? unsupervised for that long if you leave it unplugged will it be drained when you get back no the battery wouldn't drain over a month you might have yeah. some degradation but it wouldn't drain i reached out to mark at vancouver volkswagen to ask him about the id4 and he was saying no you don't have to plug it in and actually he even has a couple of clients that have gone away and they left it and it was 70 percent and when they got back it was at 69 percent yeah so no issues there at all and actually he was telling me that the id4 and it might be the same for other evs that if you go into the settings and you're concerned about the 12 volt battery which is what you know which puts is separate that, yeah that's for the, the radio and everything he says you can actually set it up that if that 12 volt battery starts to drain that you can use the drive battery hmm. to keep it charged that's interesting mm -hmm. i'll uh, show you a screenshot of it and mark's a good guy to reach out to and mm -hmm. this was uh, interesting because when we when we picked up our gti from vancouver volkswagen yeah. we found out something incredible they're the number one uh electrified dealer for Volkswagen yeah. in all of North America. They sell more ID4s than any other dealer in North America. That's and he's he's their uh, um, VW ID4 specialist. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty incredible. Vancouver is big with the ID4. Who knew? Yeah, and also he was saying like some people think about the ID4, but they're worried about inventory. And Mark says, "Come to us, we can get you one." Hello from local fans in Vancouver. Hello. By chance, do you plan to review the Volvo EX30 in the coming months? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we do. We, we hope so. We did a walk around of it. Um, it was last summer. And yeah. The yeah. EX90. Um, they've had a change at PR there at uh, Volvo, so we're waiting to hear from the new person. Yeah, so we're hoping they're going to bring it into the press fleet here in Vancouver, and then we will get on it and review it. I read from an unknown company that uh, a study the vehicle price and said an electric vehicle will be cheaper than gas vehicles in 2027. So what, what do you was, think? So what was this study? So the study is by Gartner, which is a marketing research company. And yes, they did put that out and they said that by 2027, we will see electric vehicles will be less expensive or equal to gas models. They are basing that on streamlined manufacturing, things mm -hmm. like giga pressing, um, which Tesla started. Um, so will that happen? Will that happen, Zach? What do you think? Well, I think uh, probably there's a big leap of faith there that the um, the volumes of electric cars is going to increase to the levels that they had hoped. Um, so if you're not aware, um, a lot of the countries uh, want to have, I think it's 30% EVs by mm -hmm. 2028, 50% uh, by 2030, and 100% by 2035. And with the current sales trajectory of a lot of brands outside of Tesla, yeah. those numbers are not going to be met. And we're seeing resistance from from, uh, people based on price. So if you're going to base a study on the fact that you're going to be making X number more cars by 2027, well, then you will have economies of scale, mm -hmm. right? You're going to be able to make things cheaper and you're going to make them in much bigger batches. Mm -hmm. If you don't reach those numbers, then we're at the same situation. Like, for example, Ford Motor Company is going to be making more hybrids again. So they're not focusing as much on EVs. Therefore, yeah the cost of those EVs will remain high. And here's something interesting. I actually thought the study was a bit, bit misleading when you start to break it down. Yes, they said that, but they also said that batteries are the most expensive component in an electric vehicle, representing 40% of the cost. They also went on to say that by 2027, to repair an EV, it will be 30% rise in it. If you are in a major accident okay, and there's a problem, 
problem with the body and the battery. Just want to jump in. And one of the big yeah. problems with the GigaPress that Tesla's uh, forging forward with, and Toyota and Lexus, they're going to, um, they have a GigaPress that they're, yeah. um, I think we got to get rid of Giga. We've got to stop calling I know. everything. Giga casting, Giga, Giga presses. Gotta, we got to get past that. Yeah. Um, uh, the problem with the, the that kind of casting process, it's all done under, done under extreme pressure yeah. and they're not repairable. Nope. So these are going to be disposable cars, which is going to affect interest rates. And that's uh, sorry, exact, not interest rates, insurance, insurance rates. And that's exactly what this study said, is that EVs will be more prone to write-offs. The firm also believes that EV companies that have started in the last decade, that 15% of them will either be acquired by other companies or will go bankrupt. Well, a big part of that's going to be in China, where they have over 100 EV manufacturers. Just yeah. think about that. There's like, there's dozens and dozens so and dozens of EV companies you have never heard of, I have never heard of. I've been to major Chinese motor shows uh, over the last decade and a half, and it's just mind boggling when you see how many are there. So there's gonna be consolidation with that. And I suspect some smaller brands like Fisker mm -hmm. currently is going through financial trouble and could be acquired by another brand. Rivian initially started with Ford with backing and also with um, Amazon with backing, but mm -hmm. that's all walked away. So it's gonna be interesting to see who sticks around and who doesn't. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens by 2027. The other concern I have with electric vehicles, if they're saying that they're gonna cost the same as gas models, what about all of these electric vehicles vehicles today that cost a lot of money. What happens to the resale value on those if the costs all come down? There's a lot to unbox here and what? there's a lot to look forward to in the future. Which is one of the reasons why I always say that electric cars seem to be the most popular with people who can afford them. Mm. So it's a sort of a middle and upper middle and luxury kind of product. Uh, working people, it's just not in their snack bracket. And, and so the people that can afford it and are willing to buy an uh, electric car and to take those maybe downside risks for resale value, maybe the downside risks for write-offs, they're, they're in a position where they're willing to take that risk or lease or, or lease, lease it. and give it back but, but i think the meat of the market is going to be the 30 to forty thousand dollar electric car mm -hmm, and we just mm -hmm. don't have any of those yet unless mm -hmm. if you want to get the prices down you're going to have to open up the border to chinese uh, brands and yeah. that ain't going to happen, especially if there's a change in government in the U.S. Or there'll be tariffs on it. There'll be yeah. some sort of a Actually, tax. The Biden administration has put up a pretty big uh, wall against China for these things too. So it's mm -hmm. not just it's not just Trump. Biden is really that whole Inflation Reduction Act was yeah. a basically a uh, as my friend David Booth says a big middle finger to mm -hmm. China. Yeah, for sure. Best review team on YouTube. Well, I like that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Stop right there, Andrew. Don't go on. <laughs> Say that again. Can you start again? You can read that one out again was looking at a genesis no? g70 well no. i think they got it okay was looking at a genesis g70 but heard it's getting discontinued should one avoid it as long-term buy now would the is350 be a good alternative well they just so, they just unveiled it with a refresh they know, they had they an event in phoenix area or something i know and people got to drive it and we didn't but so here's the thing i i did reach out to the genesis pr person because there are rumors that the g70 is is going away and i was thinking to myself did i miss something here did i miss a press release and what's what did going he say? on he said no he said no he says you're right there's lots of rumors we just did a refresh this model is going to carry through this refresh to 2025. He didn't say about anything after that, but he did say until 2025. Probably is the IS350 a great option? Of course. Yeah. It's an but excellent the, pr the problem option. is it's uh, you're talking about a new tech car yeah. with uh, much better uh, screens and infotainment system and all sure. that kind of stuff versus the IS, which is bulletproof and will last for many, many years, but an old tech uh, interior when it comes to the infotainment screen. So if you're fine with that infotainment screen, the IS300, in our opinion, is the best buy and the luxury sedan market but yeah. big problem is andrea this category is dying mm -hmm. people aren't buying sedans they're buying utilities and we're seeing that with other things and i have to say genesis products they offer a lot of great value a lot of them come with a ton of features at a great price point compared to the competitors one thing i find about the g70 so try it out it does sit lower to the ground it has a sporty feel though so make sure you like that 
If one day the G70 does go away, should you be concerned about it? No. I don't think so. Not at all. We see that even with the Toyota Venza. It's going away. I would not be concerned about having a model that's discontinued. Love your reviews, especially your personalities and the banter. Wow, mm. you, these guys are great, aren't they? This past week, I read how regulations in Europe will change oh. upcoming cars oh, and begin, begin to limit having so many controls embedded in touchscreens. Do you think our cars are too screen reliant? And will those European regulations change our vehicles in the near future? Absolutely. So great I just question. Wanna, I just want to back up here. Um, apparently, the head of BMW Interior Design said about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, Mm -hmm. that we have hit peak screen in cars. Yep. And they're kind of uh, leading the way with the vehicles that we've driven lately from BMW. Everything's from uh, minus a few things is done in the screen. Um, and maybe he knew that this was coming. Maybe. And uh, so the European regulator has said, if you don't have certain hard keys outside of the screen, your crash test scores will be lower because these are just as distracting as using your phone. For sure. For so sure. I applaud this. And I think yes, it's great. I, mean, I think it's going to come. Oh, totally. Yeah. It's going to come, and they don't make different cars for the European market. If they sell a BMW in Europe, it'll be the same here, same in China. Yeah. And um, and any brand that wants to sell into Europe will have to have the same thing. So BMW just went into almost everything being done in the screen. Peak screens. Except for the X5. Yeah. The X5 still has those beautiful buttons and the iDrive. I listen, I applaud this. And I think everything goes in waves. Everything goes in waves. And then everything was screens. And then you'll have one manufacturer that comes back with some really nicely done buttons that are logical. Yeah. The other one is, um, uh, speaking of German brands, we Mercedes. were on Mercedes-Benz. Yeah. And uh, I got to sit at dinner next to the head of exterior design for Mercedes-Benz. Um, it just so happened he sat next to me and I'm like, I got some questions for this guy. <laughs> and uh, it was great. Like going on these trips and meeting these people, it's, yeah, it's amazing, amazing what they'll do. And they, and they get a couple of glasses of wine in them and they, they, they tell you some stuff. Um, so I said, what's with the door, door handles, mm -hmm. with the hidden door handles on EVs? Are you doing that because of drag coefficient to make it slippery to get through the air? And he goes, no. He goes, it's just trendy. Yeah. He says, you know, of course, Tesla came out with it. Everybody follows suit. He says, we don't need to have a door handle like that to hit our drag coefficient. We can do it. Uh, the example he gave is in, in Europe or in other markets, you can get the Audi e-tron with little winglets out the side that have yeah. cameras. They're not real mirrors, they're cameras. And he said, we actually got that car and we were able to get better drag coefficient with mirrors. And here's the thing, there are EVs that have regular door handles, so it can be done. Yes. Hi guys, loving the informative and entertaining reviews, thank you. At the auto show in Toronto, a Kia rep told me that the K5 will be discontinued in Canada after 2024. What do you think that means for the midsize sedan class broadly in Canada? So let me just touch just on that to, and then you can talk about sedans. I just wanted to say, Andrea told me this last night and she said, and she read me the numbers and man, <laughs> These are ugly numbers. Ugly numbers. So you are right. The K5 is gone for Canada. Will continue they should have in named the it, U.S. They should have named it the K9 and then gotten rid of it because it's a real dog. And added a dog to it. Yeah. Woof. So, they did um, have the K900. Terrible numbers. Terrible numbers for Canada. So um, in the U.S. in 2023, they sold around 65,000 units. Guess what in Canada in 2022? This is uh, good car, bad car has these results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 390 units wow. in Canada in 2022. 390. So you, you just imagine? think about this. The cost for them to bring them in, to federalize the car, which means all the regulatory stuff, yeah. and then the training, the dealer training that has to go in, yeah. the tech training that has to go in, it's just not a viable option. Nope. And so, um, as I always say, in the midsize sedan class, because sedans are, as we all know, diminishing in popularity. We talked about that at the beginning with the luxury cars. Um, there are, it's Camry, Accord, and then everybody else. Yeah. Camry, Accord, winners, everybody else. In the compact cars, it's Corolla, Civic, Elantra, and then everybody else. Yeah, and the Camry in the U.S. in 2023, just to show you the difference, sold almost 291 units. 91,000. Sorry, 291,000 units in the U.S. And in Canada for 2022, over 6,000 units. So you can see the difference between the U.S. and Canada and why... Q5 
Kia would say enough with the K5. So it's it's interesting to see that there's so people often reach out to us because we have different trim levels and different pricing yeah. north and south of the border and they say why is it that we have such differences between Canada and the United States? Well there were taste differences and this is a perfect example mm -hmm. of where we are in Canada compared to the United States. The best sellers for sedans are the compacts. Mm -hmm. That's the Civic, the Corolla and the Elantra. In the United States it's the midsize. It's the Corolla, sorry, it's the Camry, the Accord, and so on. Those are, that's the meat of the market in the United States. It's one class bigger. Yeah. And you see that with utilities and you see that often through the entire marketplace. So Canadians like smaller, I guess we're more price sensitive for compact cars, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's just not even close. In the Camry in Canada is like nothing really. I know. Hi, Andrea and Zach. I really enjoy the reviews you put out each week. I currently drive an F-150, but I'm looking at upgrading to a new pickup truck. I'm looking for something very reliable with good fuel economy and also capable of towing at least 6,500 pounds. I've narrowed it down my search to a Sierra 1500 with mm -hmm. a three liter diesel, mm -hmm. F-150 power boost or Tundra with the hybrid powertrain. Oh, you okay? I'm going to, I'm okay. Ready? So, uh, you ready? Three, two, one. Sierra. Chevrolet. See, the diesel. Amazing. Um, so obviously diesel, I mean, you have to look at a few things. Diesel has gotten more expensive over the years. Um, I like the idea of a hybrid. Look, all of these vehicles, if you look at consumer reports and reliability, all do terrible. Really? Terrible. Let me get you those numbers. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Now, JD Power because JD gives Power them gives all better a, scores. A, good, a pretty good score, but they're all even. And okay, Consumer Chevrolet Reports is all even. Chevrolet as a brand for JD Power scores right near the very top. And mm -hmm. the biggest seller for Chevrolet are the pickup trucks. So I'm surprised. But okay, there you do go. you want to hear them? So the Sierra from Consumer Reports for Reliability, a 29 out of 100. The F-150 Hybrid, oh, 19 sorry, out of 100. A, sorry, that's that's a, I'm saying Chevrolet, it's a GMC Sierra. GMC, yeah. But it's GMC. the same truck, we know that. Yes, Tundra, 30 out of 100. Wow. So that's your better bet. Now we all know that the Tundra had some issues when it mm -hmm. first came out, so maybe those numbers are skewing that. But the F-150 Hybrid and the Sierra, if you look online, real people who own these, they are having some problems, even the GMC Sierra. Now you look at JD Power, they give them a much better score, but they're all the same. Sierra, 81 out of 100, F-150, 86 out of 100, and the Tundra, 78 out of 100. So they're okay, all, all pretty fairly close. even, yeah. So the reason why I say uh, the diesel General Motors, whether it's the Silverado or Sierra, mm -hmm. is the fact that you get much more consistent towing fuel economy. Yeah. All of these vehicles, when you're, you're hauling around air, that doesn't matter. They're all going to be heavy on fuel because they're so big and heavy. It's when you have an even bigger and heavier trailer behind it. Yeah. That's where you want torque and torque is king with diesel and torque is uh, reliable at elevation because it's turbocharged if you're towing through the mountains and you're going to get much more consistent not the same as when it's empty but you're going to get better fuel economy numbers go to the fast lane truck mm -hmm. uh, the fast lane truck um, they know their stuff um, Roman and Tommy and the whole grant uh, yeah. um, uh, they do amazing tests through the Colorado mountains towing and I watched one recently where they did exactly that truck the GM MC Sierra mm. towing and they got r amazing fuel economy with it for, yeah. to for towing. I, I think I'd still go with the diesel. Diesel, while you can get it, it will have great mileage. You know, you might pay a little bit more. I mean, there. here's the thing about diesel, depending on where you live, sometimes it's more than gas, sometimes it's less than gas. Yeah, but it goes 30%. It goes up and down, but it goes further. It goes 30% yeah. further. We, we just borrowed an, F, uh, an F-250 pickup truck from Ford yeah. and I bored it for a day. I had to take some stuff to the dump and I said, can I borrow the truck? And they said, sure. So I, I picked it up. It had 1100 kilometers of yeah. range. That's over 600 miles of range. That's crazy. Amazing. Now, it had a big ass tank, but it like, did have a big ass tank. <laughs> it was a Cost big ass truck. A, yeah. Okay. So we're going to do one more. Um, 24 Acura MDX miles per gallon has been underwhelming. 
16 to 17 miles per gallon in the sh city. Should we keep it or go for the Toyota Highlander or CX-90 for better was, fuel economy? Was that a little slip we of the tongue? We love everything else about it. Was that a little slip of the tongue there, Andrea? <laughs> Slightly. Did anybody catch it? <laughs> no, I did. Oh, um, so the so MDX, he's got a new MDX and he's disappointed with yeah, the fuel economy. That's why they're going with hybrid and gas mixed together to get better fuel economy. But you're not getting... Um, a 300 horsepower V6 no. and good fuel economy in a car that size. So here's the thing, the EPA numbers are 19 miles per gallon or 12.6 liters per 100 kilometers. So you're getting less than that. It'll get better but in the remember, summer though. It'll but yeah, I was gonna say, remember yeah. the EP, EPA numbers are the best that you can get, like good conditions, right? So if you're looking at the CX-90, it does have a 48 volt mild hybrid system on that inline six, which is separate than a hybrid, oh, a just second. so I you know. I thought you said MDX. Yes, I'm just, he's, he's curious to oh, switch to get okay. the CX-90. Okay, I just gave this whole answer on the MDX no, and I'm like, fine. and I'm that's like, fine. you're gone over the mass though. What's no, no, going no. on? So just so you know, the standard inline six gets 9.9 .9 liters per hundred kilometers in the city, 24 miles per gallon, that no. high output no. inline Line six, no. 10.3 and 23 miles per gallon. If you get the PHEV, obviously you're going to do better. It gets a combined rating of 4.2 liters equivalent per 100 kilometers, 56 miles I per gallon. I just want to say equivalent. one thing. You know what the one is to get? First off, no, I'm, I just want to say one thing. Okay. We've got that inline six cylinder from, from Mazda or Mazda and you're never going to get those numbers. No, we weren't getting those no numbers. No way, not no. even close. Those are EPA numbers. Now, the one to get. What's the one to get? Toyota Highlander Hybrid. Of course. 6.7 liters per 100 kilometers in the city. That's 35 miles per gallon. Now, that's the one to get. However, I'm Ooh. not sure. <laughs> oh, sorry. So yeah, a little sleepy. Yeah. The only thing is, you've got a 2024 model. You've driven it off the lot. So that means it's depreciated. I'm not sure you're going to make... Anyway, I'm you've got go to crunch the numbers. I'm going to go back to my old line that I love to use. Yeah. Because we're running long on time here is buying a new car is an expensive way to save money at the pump. Totally. Just let, let me say it slower. <laughs> buying a new car <laughs> is a very expensive way to save money at the pumps. You've got to pay the freight. You've got to pay the PDI. You've got to pay the taxes. You've got to pay all of the fees. You've got to pay the difference in price from the old one to the new one. Yeah. You can buy a whole lot of gas for that. Just I say you drive about, the MDX. The MDX yeah. is a great product. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Have fun with it. And guess what? Your EPA, your, your true fuel economy numbers aren't that different. The EPA numbers are 19 miles per gallon. So I would and just, just stick wait with the for the, the warmer weather. It will get yeah. better. It will get better. And don't drive like a maniac <laughs> like Andrea. Don't put it in sport mode, okay? Yeah, there you go. Stop it. All Watch right, it. so we're, we're lo running long I here, know, Andrea. we did run long. Okay, um, follow along on Instagram at motormouth underscore Andrea to get in a question for questions, coffee, and cars every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Pacific time. Put a post out. It's only up for a short time once we get our questions. It's deleted and we start the show. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. If you like what you see, subscribe.